let's take a look at phase changes and MCAT. So when we talk about phase changes, usually the image that comes to mind is melting ice or boiling water or something like that. But from an energy perspective, when we talk about changing phase, what we're talking about is changing potential energy. Because remember, in a solid, there's strong forces between the molecules, and those forces are associated with a potential energy. In a liquid, there's less strong forces between the molecules, and those forces are, again, associated with a different potential energy. And in a gas, there's almost no forces between the molecules, so there's almost no potential energy. In each situation, going from a solid to a liquid means changing the potential energy. And then going from a liquid to a gas, again, means changing the potential energy. All right. Now a couple terms we got to get out of the way. Uh, solid to a liquid, that's called melting. Liquid to a gas, that's called boiling. Gas to a liquid, that's called condensation. And liquid to a solid, that's called freezing. All right. Now, we're going to look at a classic graph. Imagine a situation where we are transferring thermal energy to an object at a constant rate. The graph is going to be temperature of the object versus time. And the object is going to start as a solid. As we transfer thermal energy to the object, we'd expect its temperature to go up. And it's going to go up until it starts to melt. Once it starts to melt, the temperature will remain constant. And it will remain constant until that phase change is complete, until we have completely changed it to a liquid. Once it's completely a liquid, the temperature will go up again until it reaches its boiling point, at which point the temperature will stay constant until we've completely changed from a liquid to a gas. And once it's completely a gas, the temperature will go up again. Now the reason for this, during these parts where the temperature is increasing, what's happening is the added energy is going into increasing the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So from an energy perspective, when we add energy during these parts, when the temperature is increasing, we're increasing the average kinetic energy of the molecules, which is the same as increasing the temperature of the substance. Now, these parts where the temperature is constant, when we're adding energy to the substance there, we're not increasing the average kinetic energy of the molecules. Instead, we're increasing the potential energy of the substance. We're increasing the potential energy associated with those intermolecular forces. Now, let's look a little more closely at those regions where we're not changing phase, where we are completely a solid, a liquid, or a gas. In those situations, when we add thermal energy to the object, we're changing the average kinetic energy of the molecules. We're changing the temperature of the object. And we have an equation to describe this, and that's Q is equal to mc delta t. This is sometimes called the mcat equation, because it looks like mcat. Yeah. It's not very creative. The Q represents the thermal energy being transferred to the object. M represents the mass of the object. C represents the specific heat capacity of the object. We'll get back to that in a moment. And then delta T represents the change in the temperature of the object. And I want to remind you, the change in the temperature of an object is the same in Kelvin and in degrees Celsius. All right. So back to the specific heat capacity. It's represented with a lowercase c. And it is a measure of the energy that's required to change the temperature of an object by one Kelvin per kilogram. All right. Uh, it's different for each substance, and it's different for each phase. So, for example, water ice has a different specific heat capacity than liquid water, which has a different specific heat capacity than vaporized water. The unit of specific heat capacity is the joule per kilogram per Kelvin, which is the same as the joule per kilogram per degree Celsius. You can convince yourself of that if you look at the equation. Now, one way to interpret the specific heat capacity is a low value of specific heat capacity means it doesn't take much energy to change the temperature of the substance, whereas a high specific heat capacity means it does take a lot of energy to change the temperature of a substance. Um, an example of a low specific heat capacity material is aluminum. It's very easy to change the temperature of aluminum. A little bit of energy will change aluminum's temperature a lot. 
Water is an example of a material, or at least liquid water, is a material that has a high specific E capacity, which means that it takes an enormous amount of energy to change the temperature of liquid water. All right. Now, during a phase change, let's talk about those parts of the graph. During a phase change, when we add thermal energy to the object, we're not changing the temperature, we're not changing the average kinetic energy of the molecules, we're changing the potential energy that's associated with the intermolecular forces. And in those situations, we have another equation to describe this, and that's Q is equal to ML. Q, again, is the thermal energy that we're transferring to the object, M is the mass of the object, and L is the specific latent heat. Specific latent heat is the energy per mass to change the phase of something. Um, and it is different for every substance and for every phase change. So again, if we talk about water, um, the specific latent heat of melting is different than the specific latent heat of vaporization for water. And also, strangely, they don't call it the specific latent heat of melting. Instead, they use an older term. They call it the specific latent heat of fusion. It gets a little confusing because we're not talking about nuclear fusion here. We're talking about melting, but that's the term they use. The unit of specific latent heat is the joule per kilogram. So let's go back to our graph, this temperature versus time where we're adding the uh, thermal energy at a constant rate. We can have very different looking graphs. So I'm just going to sketch a graph right here. In this graph, uh, if you look, it took a longer amount of time to boil than to melt. Um, now that's not true for all substances. That just happens to be true for the graph that I drew. But if it took longer for it to boil than to melt, what that's telling me is it requires more energy to boil it than to melt it which means that the specific latent heat of vaporization is greater than the specific latent heat of fusion for this substance. And if you look at the gradients, uh, the gradient of the graph is greater during the solid phase than during the, say, liquid phase. What that tells me is that it's easier to change the temperature of this substance as a solid than it is to change the temperature of the substance as a liquid. And that means that the specific heat capacity as a liquid is greater than the specific heat capacity as a solid. The gradient of the graph is related to the specific heat capacity of the substance. Now, lastly, I want to bring up the old idea of power. And the reason why is because in these graphs, I've been saying that thermal energy is being transferred at a constant rate. Well, if we're transferring energy at a constant rate, what we're doing is we're doing work at a constant rate. And if we're doing work at a constant rate, well, the rate at which work is done is the power. So before, we would talk about power is equal to sorry, delta W over delta T, where this is the work that's being done over the time that it takes to do that work. Now, in these contexts, we're going to use an equation that power is equal to Q over T, or if you'd like, delta Q over delta T, where power is equal to the rate at which we are transferring thermal energy. That'll just come up a lot in these kinds of problems.